Yeah, great. Thank you. Yeah. Welcome to the Concord Free Public Library. We're going to start um, the overflow seating. We'll have a special visit by Kate sometime during the evening. So if you're in the other room, do not despair. She'll be in to see you. Um, I'm Karen Ahern. I'm the children's librarian here. Um, this is the eighth in the Leslie Rydell Memorial Lecture Series. I want to thank Rod Rydell and his family for the continued support for these very special events. Due to the generosity of the family of Leslie Rydell, we have been able to meet some of the best authors and illustrators of youth literature whose books are being published today. Because of the popularity of this year's speaker, Kate, <laughs> We do have chairs set up in the children's room, and the program is going to be simulcast. Um, the format of the evening will be, I believe, a reading, and then we don't know yet. We're yeah, planning no, this. I just was, can I join you, you up here? For oh, yes. Yeah. This is <laughs> so so we, it, it's billed as a lecture, but I was like, um, I, I walked into this room, and y'all are so um, present and everything that I think that uh, can we just have a show of hands? Who wants a lecture and who wants to just talk and do Q&A? Um, lecture. Q&A. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you feel like that kind of group. Okay, now okay, we're going to Okay, good. So yeah. then I can just cut through one of these, um, <laughs> these paragraphs. <laughs> um, children from Concord Elementary Schools are representing their classes. Um, there was so much interest in being here tonight that they had to have a school lottery. And these kids won. Um, there were 100 kids who wanted to represent the school. So we're going to be taking their questions anyway, questions from the um, simulcast room, and uh, questions from you. Um, I need to thank a, a group of people for helping to make this evening possible. Um, Sherry Litwack, the president of the trustees, Carrie Cronin, the library director, my colleagues Fiona Stevenson and Caroline Nee, the Friends of the Concord Free Public Library for providing the refreshments, um, Ian Urza Leggett and Tracy Miracle and the rest of the Miracle crew, I had to say that, from Candlewick Press, and Porter Square Books for providing some of the books for the sale at the autograph session. Short biography. Kate DiCamillo was born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and because she was often sick as a young child, she and her family moved to Florida, and her sickly childhood provided her with a lot of time for her imagination to take off. She majored in English at the University of Florida and moved to Minneapolis, Minnesota, where she worked in a book warehouse and then um, was drawn to uh, writing for children. Her carefully selected words enable her to create unique and varied characters. We meet Opal, the lonely girl from Because of Winn-Dixie. We meet two friends who discover a caged tiger in the novel Tiger Rising. We meet a mouse who falls in love with a princess in The Tale of Despero, a china rabbit that learns about love in The Miraculous Journey of Edward Tulane, an orphan in The Magician's Elephant, a young comic book lover and a squirrel in Flora and Ulysses, a young girl trying to get her father to return home in Raimi Nightingale, and now the new book. You, whoops, you each have something on your chair with the um, new um, information about the new book. We meet Louisiana Elefante, whose grandmother wakes her in the middle of the night to leave their home in Louisiana's way home. In addition, she has written numbers of series books for younger readers. We have Mercy Watson, um, Bink and Golly, The Tale of Decaru Drive. And her talent, this is really important, her talent has been honored with two Newbery Medals, the first in 2004 for The Tale of Despero, and the second in 2014 for Flora and Ulysses, The Illuminated Adventures. She had a two-year term as the National Ambassador for Young People's Literature, which was awarded in 2014 by the Library of Congress, which provided a forum for her enthusiasm and passion for talking about the importance of reading. Please join me in welcoming Kate DiCamillo. Okay, so y'all volunteered to, to talk. That, so that's what we're going to do. Um, I was here, what year was that? Was that 2000? So um, Because of When Dixie was um, the first book that I published, and that came out in 2000. And um, you were going to introduce me. Yes. 
don't you think you should tell that story? <laughs> it's a really good story because she just told it to me. I don't remember it. Yeah, cut, so cut, cut, come back up here. Yeah. <laughs> well, way back in 2000, I guess it was, um, the Festival of Authors was having Kate DiCamillo right after the book was published. And I was assigned to go to the bookstore and introduce her. And um, Ann Ursa Leggett was pregnant with one of her boys. And I'm standing there, and I'm standing there, and I'm standing there, and I'm standing there. And the kids are all in the circle around on the floor. And this one person sitting on the chair wearing blue jeans and swinging her legs back and forth. And this is going on for quite a while, and I'm beginning to get a little worried because I don't know anything Where's at all the about the, Yes. <laughs> and I went over to Ann, and I said, what do we do? The author's not here yet. And she said, well, she's been sitting in front of you this entire time. <laughs> So that was me, yeah, and, and, and I'm no more uh, mature now, I'm just, you know, gray-haired. So I thought that it might be good since that was 18 years ago to, uh, how many of y'all have read Because of Winn-Dixie? Um, what if I started off by reading the first chapter Because of Winn-Dixie allowed, and then um, that would kind of like, and then we could go from there as far as talking uh, about books and life and that kind of thing. Who's got a copy of Because of Winn-Dixie that I can borrow? I know you, yes. Excellent, thank you. How, how many books do you have in there? Four, Four. okay, all right. She, well, you didn't drive almost two hours. Your mother drove you almost two hours to be here because that's a different kind of alarming story, right? Yeah. Okay, so chapter one. My name is India Opal Baloney. And last summer, my daddy, the preacher, sent me to the store for a box of macaroni and cheese, some white rice, and two tomatoes, and I came back with a dog. This is what happened. I walked into the produce section of the Winn-Dixie grocery store to pick out my two tomatoes, and I almost bumped right into the store manager. He was standing there all red-faced, screaming and waving his arms around. Who let a dog in here, he kept on shouting. Who let a dirty dog in here? At first, I didn't see a dog. There were just a lot of vegetables rolling around on the floor, tomatoes and onions and green peppers, and there was what seemed like a whole army of Winn-Dixie employees running around waving their arms, just the same way the store manager was waving his. And then the dog came running around the corner. He was a big dog and ugly, and he looked like he was having a real good time. His tongue was hanging out and he was wagging his tail. He skidded to a stop and smiled right at me. I had never before in my life seen a dog smile, but that is what he did. He pulled back his lips and showed me all his teeth. Then he wagged his tail so hard that he knocked some oranges off a display and they went rolling everywhere, mixing in with the tomatoes and onions and green peppers. The manager screamed, somebody grab that dog. The dog went running over to the manager, wagging his tail and smiling. He stood up on his hind legs. You could tell that all he wanted to do was get face to face with the manager and thank him for the good time he was having in the produce department. But somehow he ended up knocking the manager over. And the manager must have been having a bad day because lying there on the floor right in front of everybody, he started to cry. The dog leaned over him real concerned and licked his face. Please, said the manager, somebody call the pound. Wait, wait a minute, I hollered. That's my dog. Don't call the pound. All the Winn-Dixie employees turned around and looked at me, and I knew I had done something big and maybe stupid too, but I couldn't help it. I couldn't let that dog go to the pound. Here, boy, I said. The dog stopped licking the manager's face and put his ears up in the air and looked at me like he was trying to remember where he knew me from. Here, boy, I said again, and then I figured that the dog was probably just like everybody else in the world, that he would want to get called by a name, only I didn't know what his name was, so I just said the first thing that came into my head, I said, here, Winn-Dixie. And that dog came trotting over to me just like he'd been doing it his whole life. The manager sat up and gave me a hard stare like maybe I was making fun of him. It's his name, I said, Honest. The manager said, don't you know not to bring a dog into a grocery store? Yes, sir, I told him he got in by mistake. I'm sorry, it won't happen again. Come on, Winn-Dixie, I said to the dog. 
I started walking, and he followed along behind me as I went out of the produce department and down the cereal aisle and past all the cashiers and out the door. Once we were safe outside, I checked him over real careful, and he didn't look that good. He was big, but skinny. You could see his ribs, and there were bald patches all over him, places where he didn't have any fur at all. Mostly, he looked like a big piece of old brown carpet that had been left out in the rain. You're a mess, I told him. I bet you don't belong to anybody. He smiled at me. He did that thing again where he pulled back his lips and showed me his teeth. He smiled so big that it made him sneeze. It was like he was saying, I know I'm a mess. Isn't it funny? It's hard not to immediately fall in love with a dog who has a good sense of humor. Come on, I told him. Let's see what the preacher has to say about you. And the two of us, me and Win dixie started walking home. So let me hand you that book back. Yes. And... So I, 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 I have to say that uh, sometimes um, kids always want me to pick the favorite of the, my books that I've written, and I can't do that. But that book, uh, and particularly that dog, holds a very special place in my heart because everything that's happened to me as a writer has happened because of Win dixie You know, it all it opened the door to, to everything. Um, can I ask you all real quickly how many teachers are in here? That's nice. How many of you teachers read out loud to your uh, students? Can we have a round of applause for the teachers who... I, I think about this all the time because I was a kid who, uh, I had a mother who read to me, who bought me books, who took me to the library, and in second grade, um, my teacher was Mrs. Boyette, and she read uh, every day after lunch, and she read Island of the Blue Dolphins. And uh, how many of y'all know that book? It's so good. It's here in the library if you want to check it out, isn't it? Yes, yeah. Um, and I, I like lived to hear that story, and I was a kid who was getting story at home, so I think um, for the kids who aren't getting it at home, you're, you're changing lives by doing that. And um, I never thought to thank Mrs. Boyette for it, so I'll thank y'all instead. So um, who, who wants to ask a question before we move on to Louisiana? Okay, there you are right there. Yes. Is Louisiana's Way Home a sequel to Ramey Nightingale? Now you're getting into marketing questions kind of thing. So, so we've got some verbiage around this that they've come up with. It is what the publisher calls a companion novel. So you do not, if you were just like, you know, walking through the library and you saw Louisiana and you hadn't read Ramey, you could read Louisiana uh, without going back and reading Ramey. So technically, it's not a sequel. It is, you know, a companion novel sums it up pretty well. That's why those marketing people are, you know, paid the big bucks, right, to, to think of those terms. Um, did I see a hand over here that went up? Yes. What was my favorite subject in school? English. I loved reading. I was no good at math. Um, and uh, then the second part of your question uh, which I'll just have to repeat it and then give some, um, you know, put some asterisks next to my name, is why did that subject make me such a good writer? And I don't, I, I don't want to argue with you about whether or not I'm a good writer, but I will say that um, part of what made me a writer is all those books that I read. I, from the time I learned to read, I was somebody who lived for books, and I'm still that person. Above and beyond anything else, if you ask me to define myself, I am a reader, and a reader before I'm a writer, because all those books that I read made me want to write a book. How many writers are there out there? So good with the kids and good with the adults, too. Brave of all of you. Yes. Okay, who's going to ask the next really impossible question? Yes. My favorite book in fifth grade. Um, I'm 54, so that was a long time ago. Um, and although I can remember, all, you know, I, I would get on a jags with certain books where I would reread them and reread them, and I don't know exactly what uh, my favorite book was in fifth grade, but I can tell you the book that I was uh, really intent on avoiding in fifth grade. Do you want to know what that was? It's a book, um, you might have heard of it, called Charlotte's Web. Okay, so let me explain myself. So. Um, I read Black Beauty. How many of y'all have read Black Beauty? And um, I was traumatized 
by what happened to that horse. I mean, it just did me in. If I had known to beg for therapy, I would have begged for therapy, but I didn't know. The only thing I could think of was, all right, that's it. Do not check out any more books with animals on the cover. That was the rule that I came up with. So um, I would go to the library and look at the cover of Charlotte's Web. And have you ever like really studied Wilbur's face on the cover of that book? That is a worried looking pig, right? <laughs> and I thought, something terrible is going to happen here and I'm not having anything to do with the suffering of a pig. So I never read it. And then I took, um, I guess I was probably like maybe 31 and I took a writing workshop and the person who was leading it kind of um, shamed me in front of the whole class saying I had no business uh, writing for kids or wanting to write for kids unless I, I read Charlotte's Web. And then she quoted the first line of, of the book. Do you all know it? Where's Papa going with that axe? And I thought, it's even worse than I thought it was going to be. I mean, like we're starting off with an axe, right? And so I, I read it, and um, that's like one of my, that I, it's impossible for me ever to pick a favorite book, fifth grader now, but that's right at the top, and I reread it every year. It's one of the, how many of y'all have read Charlotte's Web? How, how many of you have cried when you read Charlotte's Web? <laughs> How many of you cried on the radio when you're reading from Charlotte's Web? It's, it's embarrassing, but it gets me every time. Um, okay, I don't want to uh, ignore you people in the back right here, please. Yes. Yep. What do I write on? I write on a computer, and I have to say, and this will probably not have any resonance for you, but for the adults it will. I would not be standing up here talking to you without the computer, I don't think, because anybody who's been working on their term paper at 3 o'clock in the morning uh, on a typewriter, something you've probably heard of, with a, a whiteout, and footnotes, it's just like, I don't, I really don't know if I would have been able to take uh, a draft all the way through and turn in a draft that would have been, you know, professional enough if I was just left to the typewriter. So I write on the computer and I journal by hand. I'm a different writer when I write by hand and uh, as opposed to when I write on the computer. I have a little bit more confidence on the computer. Um, yes. What authors inspired me to become a writer? Every good book that I read. Um, a, a lot of Beverly Cleary, I got only part of Beverly Cleary because uh, some of the, like, the Ramona books came after I had grown up, but um, Mouse and the Motorcycle, loved those. I loved all the Laura Ingalls Wilder's books. There was a biography of um, George Washington Carver that I checked out from the library uh, so many times that my mother, I remember my mother saying to the librarian, can we just buy this? And uh, the librarian saying, you know, it doesn't work like that, Betty. Um, and, but it's just like I would get obsessed with um, certain books. And every book, um, there's a wonderful Newbery winner called uh, The 21 Balloons. Has anybody read that? I was obsessed with that for a long time. So I, all those books fed my imagination. And like Karen said in the introduction, being sick was a really helpful thing for me, I guess. Um, and that when you're, you, we didn't get a TV until I was in fourth grade, and I was home a lot alone, uh, sick, and um, you, you learn to live in your imagination. And that's good, because that's paying the bills now, right? Yes. Where do I get my ideas for my books? I, I, I eavesdrop. I'm not going to lie to you. Um, so you know what eavesdropping is, right? Yeah. So actually, it's a, lot, it, it's a lot more subtle than that. So I always have a notebook with me. I carry the notebook with me everywhere I go. I'm always listening to what people say. I'm always looking around me. And I'm always paying attention to the strange things that go through my own head and it all goes in the notebook. It looks like you have a further follow-up question about that. Uh, no, you don't. OK, all right. Um, uh, back there, yes, yes. Do I also illustrate my books? No, I can't draw my way out of a paper bag. I, I wish that I could illustrate my books, but I can't do it, and I have been um, blessed with so many fantastic illustrators. Um, and it's an interesting thing to get your book illustrated because how many of you, when you're, um, when you're reading a book, you see it in your head? 
Um, they say it's about 70% of us kind of see. And, and so when I'm writing, I see it. And then somebody else reads what I've written and they turn it into images and so it's different than what I saw. That, that has been the case every time except for, uh, how many of y'all have read Miraculous Journey of Edward Tulane? Um, that book, the Grom Ibatuin, who did the illustrations there, he painted what was in my head as I was writing, which was kind of frightening, I have to say. <laughs> yeah, it was like he was in there with me. Um, yes? My favorite book that I've written so far is just, it's absolutely impossible for me to pick. The way I try to explain that is, um, are, you, are you here with a parental unit? Yeah, wait, did I see a hand over there? Yes, hello, and is that your only child? Uh, no, I have two others. Okay, and do you like this one the best? <laughs> <laughs> see, you get very flustered, I, yeah. It, it, let, me, let me help you, you love the children equally but differently, right? Yeah. Yes, so, and that's, that's the same way it is with me for the books. I, I see them as deeply flawed but lovable anyway. And the, not that I'm saying anything about what's going on back there. I'm just saying that it's just, it's a complicated but equal amount of love for, for each book. Um, uh, yes, over here. Do I have my stories planned out in my head before I start writing or do I plan it as I go? There's no planning at all. To, to use the word planning is over. I, I, um, I usually start with an image or a phrase and I have no idea what's gonna happen. And one time I was in Connecticut talking to a gymnasium full of kids and uh, a, a boy raised his hand and said, we've got a writing uh, class and um, we have to make an outline of the story before uh, we're, we can write it. Um, and I said, that's, that's what the teacher, he said, that's what the teacher makes us do. I said, is that teacher in the gymnasium now? And um, fortunately or unfortunately she was, so I had to turn to her and say, if I was in your class and you were having me write a story, I would not be able to do it that way. I just, I can't. And this is one of the great secrets and terrible truths of writing, is there's no right way to do it. It is very much an individual journey and everybody has to figure it out for themselves as, as they go. People can encourage you, um, and people can guide you, but it is still you finding your way through it. And for me, what works is to um, do a, a terrible uh, first draft where I have no idea what's gonna happen and I look kind of like Jack Nicholson in The Shining. And that's what that first draft looks like too, is like he wrote that. And then I go back and do a second draft that gets, makes a little bit more sense, and then a third draft and a fourth draft. And that's, that's the way I, I coax myself through it. Um, yes, right back there, yes. How long does it usually take to make a book? It depends. Um, so it's usually a novel is about a year or a year and a half. Some of them um, are easier to write than others. Edward Tulane was one of those books that kind of wrote itself and I thought, oh boy, I figured out how to write a novel, I've cracked that. And then the next one was just really, really difficult. So it, it depends. And usually for me, it's um, rewriting it eight or nine times before it goes to my editor and then rewriting it for her. So I rewrite from beginning to end m multiple times, each time telling myself it, it will get better with the next draft. And sometimes it does, and sometimes it doesn't. Um, Yes, yep. Okay, both very good questions. So the first one is, at what age did I know that I wanted to be a writer? So I went to the University of Florida, I majored in English because then um, you know, I could use my parents' money to buy 30 or 40 novels and that's, you know, that was what I had to do was read. And I never really thought about what I was gonna do with an English degree. And in my senior year, I had a professor say to me, these words which are really burned into my brain you have a certain facility with words, period. You should consider graduate school, period. So I was 20 years old when he said that to me and I was full of myself. So I thought, this gentleman is speaking to me in code. He's trying to tell me that I'm the next Flannery O'Connor. And um, why should I bother with graduate school? I'll just go and be a writer. So I got, uh, I used my mother's JCPenney credit card and I got a black turtleneck. And then I was all set. 
So I spent literally, and I'm not, I'm not exaggerating, almost 10 years um, wearing the black turtleneck and sitting around looking bored and disdainful and having everybody go, oh, that's Kate, she writes. And, um, and it, it, I read books on writing, I dreamed about being a writer, I did not write. And then uh, right before I turned 30, I, I saw that I could easily spend the rest of my life exerting all this energy, pretending to be somebody, and it would actually be easier to do the work. So I started, when I was 30, to write two pages a day. So that's the first question. The second question is, uh, when, I am in a, uh, when I do a novel and I'm in the eighth draft or the ninth draft, do I, at some point, read the book aloud to myself? Which is a wonderful question that doesn't get asked very often, and, and it is very pertinent to how I work. Because, yes, I do. I don't read it into, uh, I've heard of people who read it into a, a tape recorder, I don't do that. But if you read it aloud, you can tell if it's right or not. And that's, and it's, it's very laborious, and again, you look like Jack Nicholson in The Shining as you're doing it. But that is the best way to tell whether or not it's, it's working. So yes, reading it aloud. Yes, a question from the other room. In your new book, who is the illustrator? In the new book, who's the illustrator? It is, her name is Amy June Bates. Is that right, Chris Paul? Yes, Amy June Bates. And um, it is gorgeous, gorgeous art. Speaking of the new book, does anybody have a Louisiana? And I'll, I'll read you the, the first chapter there. Yes? Oh, look. Yep. <laughs> we'll look. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. Okay, so Louisiana showed up first in uh, the novel that came before this, Ramey Nightingale, um, and um, she was not the main character, but she was certainly central to what went on. And I have never, once I finish a novel, I don't, I don't go back. Um, and and that, that's, um, I've gotten a lot of very enthusiastic, some. Um, physically violent letters about how I should go back. Uh, for, for one of the very first letters I got was from this little boy in Illinois who would be grown up now. He wrote me like a 10 page letter outlining what was going to happen in Winn-Dixie 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. <laughs> I mean outlining it. And then at the very end he squeezed in this PS. I have done all the hard work. Get busy. <laughs> and so that's, you know, pretty pretty stern words. So I've been encouraged to go back to books and I've never, I've never felt the pull. But what happened here was, and this, it's hard to, to talk about this without sounding slightly off, but is like Louisiana did not go away. And um, she really wanted to tell more of her story. So I'll read just a little bit of that. Chapter one. I'm going to write it all down so that what happened to me will be known. So that if someone were to stand at their window at night and look up at the stars and think, my goodness, whatever happened to Louisiana Elefante? Where did she go? They will have an answer. They will know. This is what happened. I will begin at the beginning. The beginning is that my great-grandfather was a magician. And long, long ago, he set into motion a most terrible curse but right now, you do not need to know the details of the terrible curse. You only need to know that it exists and that it is a curse that has been passed down from generation to generation. It is, as I said, a terrible curse. And now it has landed upon my head. Keep that in mind. We left in the middle of the night. Granny woke me up, she said. The day of reckoning has arrived. The hour is close at hand. We must leave immediately. It was 3 a.m., we went out to the car, and the night was very dark, but the stars were shining brightly. Oh, there were so many stars. And I noticed that some of the stars had arranged themselves into a shape that looked very much like someone with a long nose telling a lie, the Pinocchio constellation. I pointed out the starry Pinocchio to Granny, but she was not at all interested. Hurry, hurry, said Granny. There is no time for stargazing. We have a date with destiny. So I got in the car. And we drove away. I did not think to look behind me. How could I have known that I was leaving for good? 
I thought that I was caught up in some middle of the night idea of Granny's and that when the sun came up, she would think better of the whole thing. This has happened before. Granny has many middle of the night ideas. I fell asleep and when I woke up, we were still driving. The sun was coming up and I saw a sign that said Georgia, 20 miles. Georgia. We were about to change states, and Granny was still driving as fast as she could, leaning close to the windshield because her eyesight is not very good, and she's too vain to wear glasses, and also because she's very short, shorter almost than I am, and she has to lean close to reach the gas pedal. In any case, the sun was bright. It was lighting up the splotches and stains on the windshield and making them look like glow-in-the-dark stars that someone had pasted there as a surprise for me. I love stars. Oh, how I wish that someone had pasted glow-in-the-dark stars on our windshield. However, that was not the case. I said, Granny, when are we going to turn around and go back home? Granny said, we are never going to turn around, my darling. The time for turning around has ended. So it starts off with a dramatic bang and it kind of keeps on in a dramatic fashion because Louisiana herself is very dramatic and very intent on surviving. Um, so who's, who's got other questions? Yes. Huh, that's an interesting question. So this is a question about secondary characters and uh, a compliment about them being strong, but have I ever started a story with one character in mind and then the secondary character has taken over the story. I have, I have been surprised by the secondary characters. Characters show up that I did not anticipate. Um, does anybody know the Tiger Rising? Um, so that starts with um, a boy finding a tiger in the cage in the woods. It's very much, I know it's gonna be his story. And then I'm on the school bus with him and, uh, and a, a new girl steps on the bus and her name is Sistine Bailey. And from the minute she stepped on that bus, she surprised me, and it was a constant uh, battle to make sure that she did not take over the book. The same thing happened when I was writing Raimi, and I didn't anticipate Louisiana showing up. Some characters are so strong that they want to, to take over, or they want a book entirely about themselves, right? So, um, and and I, I just never really know what's gonna happen which is one of the thrilling ways of, uh, 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 to write, but it would be really nice to be able to do it with an outline so I wasn't constantly getting surprised. Um, yes? How do you come up with the characters' names? How do I come up with the characters' names? I have to tell you in all honesty, every part of writing is hard for me, except for the names. And that goes back to the notebook and making sure that I always have the notebook with me because sometimes I'll misread signs and that will turn into a name. Sometimes my brain just comes up with them out of nowhere, and I don't know why that is. I, I grew up in the South, um, and I was surrounded by strange names growing up. One morning I, I woke up and thought, wow, did I really go to school with a boy named General Payne, or am I just like making that up in retrospect? So I called my best friend and I said, did we go to school with a boy named General Payne? And she said, oh yeah, General Payne and his brother Sergeant Payne. <laughs> and so it's just like, I think that if that, if that, it kind of distorts your mind early on, you know, or it gives you, you know, and so I, I, I think it's a combination of the South and then um, just being willing to look at the world in a slightly wonky way. But I, as soon as I have the character name, then I'm really kind of in business. Um, it's, how many of y'all know Mercy Watson? Wow. Okay, so that was like a thing where I, I'm on an airplane, I'm sitting there minding my own business, and all of a sudden I see a pig's face, and underneath it conveniently is her name, Mercy. And it was like, that's great. So I, it's a pig named Mercy seems very funny, and I went home and I figured out that she lived with Mr. and Mrs. Watson and that they're not pigs. And so I started like working on the story, and I could never quite get it to gel. And then I got my very first brand new car. It was super exciting. I'd never had a brand new car before. I took a friend to the airport the first day that I had it. She got into my car with a gigantic piece of toast. And it had a lot of butter on it. And she started to eat it in my brand new car. 
spraying greasy crumbs everywhere. And I'm like, can you, like, this is a brand new car. Can you wait and finish your toast at the airport? And it didn't stop her. She kept right on eating the toast, but she also gave me a lecture about how toast should have a great deal of butter on it and how it should be buttered all the way to the edges and how it tasted better if someone else made it for you. And so by the time I got home, I knew what was missing in the story about the pig, um, which is what the pig loved, which is toast with a great deal of butter. So that's what happened from one name, right? Just from, from Mercy. So uh, yes, you've got a purple, uh, yes. You guys have gotten a lot of really uh, process interesting questions here. Have I ever abandoned a book in the middle of writing it? Yes, absolutely. Um, and I've also learned not to throw anything away because sometimes I can come back to it and see it more clearly and know what to do. And um, also I have found a lot of times when you're writing a novel, there always comes a point in the middle of writing it when you think, oh, I've got an idea for a better book because this one is no fun at all. And so you, there's always a moment where you think, I'm going to go and work on something else. And I've learned to um, ask myself a couple questions when that happens. And the questions are, am I afraid? The answer is usually yes. Am I lazy? The answer is usually yes. So I've learned mostly not to abandon them, but to keep on going and kind of push through that saggy middle part. Are you a writer? Okay, that's right. You don't have to commit yourself any further than that. That's good. Okay. Uh, yes, over here. Oh, that's so interesting. You did such a beautiful job of projecting to the room. I was thinking to myself, you must be a teacher, and then you said you're a teacher. So did you all hear the question? So sometimes in my books, there are characters who don't have names. And in Edward Tulane, there's a character who finds him at a certain point and uses him as a scarecrow, and she doesn't have a name. And her students want to know if that is purposeful on my part. And um, you'll have to go back to them and tell them this. I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, and, and, and I mean it. I mean, it's just like I don't know. And it's so interesting to, I remember the very first time I did a school visit and I went in and I stood up at the front of the room with the teacher and she said to the kids, we're going to talk about the themes in this book. And I felt a drop of sweat move down the side of, and it's like, the themes? What are the themes in the book? And then I listened to the teacher and the kids, mercifully, work together to come up with the themes. And they wrote them down on the board. And then uh, I left the class, very much enlightened, went out to my car, <laughs> wrote down the themes, and next school visit I did, all right, all right, let's talk about some of the themes that are in this book. <laughs> but like, it's, I don't, I really don't know what I'm doing. And, and, I, and, I, and I'm not being facetious when I say that. It's, it is uh, a group effort between me and, and you, the, the readers. And together, I mean, I learn, I, you know, Louisiana just came out last week, and prior to that, I did a, a lot of interviews. And in each interview, each good interview, helped me understand what the book was about and, and helped me to talk about it more. But it doesn't become complete until it goes into somebody else's hands. And so why that character doesn't have a name, you would, probably the kids would be able to figure it out better than I could. Does that make sense? See, that, and that's really smart. And if that child was interviewing me or writing his you know, PhD thesis on uh, literary criticism, I could take that then and use it in discussing about the book, but I don't know that it, it's there. It does become like a communal kind of effort. And are, are you a teacher as well? So again, you guys are very, I think there are a lot of writers in this room with all these um, uh, writing questions. So this is a question about process and do I, since I now, uh, Let's just phrase it this way, write and publish a lot of books, do I still go to a critique group? Um, and I don't, but I have a group of friends who are absolutely reliable. And about the fifth draft, I will give a, uh, the fifth draft of a, a novel to these friends and I will say, I, I, it doesn't seem necessary and true. And, that's, and, and if it doesn't, then that would stop me, but I don't want a lot of 
uh, little questions at that point because they can derail me. You have to be very careful about when you let somebody see something because they can stop you by asking the wrong questions. But it's also necessary to like show it to people that you trust. And so they act as an informal critique group and most of them are writers. So, and I've learned to trust them. Yes. Does something inspire me to write my books? For a long time I worked at uh, Walt Disney World um, and Epcot Center, uh, and I wore a blue polyester spacesuit. And um, my job was to tell people to uh, watch their step. So I would <laughs> st say, look down and watch your step here, please. Watch your step, look down and watch your step. And alternately, how many people in your party? One up front, two in the back. How many people in your party? Two up front, two in the back, look down and watch your step. Um, and I did that for eight hours a day. And um, that was relatively inspiring as, for, as far as doing something different, you know? You start to think, what else is there? Yeah. Um, yes. Do I have a writing routine? I am uh, uh, that same uh, wonderful group of friends that reads for me and likes to call me rigid. So I'm, I am rigid. Or you could say I'm disciplined. That's how I like to think about it. But because I wasted all that time, from 20 to 30, wanting to do something and not doing it. And, and I found that this incremental two pages a day worked for me. So, and I also found that um, I, I have a voice in my head that says, you don't know what you're doing, you can't do this, that internal critic that I think most of us have. And um, I get up at uh, usually 5, 5.30 in the morning, and I go downstairs right away, and I do those two, two pages. And by the time I'm done, um, that critical voice um, shows up around 9 o'clock in the morning, and I've already done the important work because, you know, so that the voice that's saying you can't do this doesn't seem to get up early for me. So I've, I've learned to work around myself. And I've also learned that if I'm going to do it later in the day, I don't do it. So I do it before I can talk myself out of doing it. Um, and I move very, very slowly. But two pages a day is, is a novel in a year's time. So uh, yes, right there, please. Wow. Um, uh, I, well, I would first tell you, just in pushing back on some of what you said, something that my mother always used to say about me, which is that I'm best in small doses. So, <laughs> don't, you know, it's like, um, and, and the Mercy Watson books are so much fun to write because they're funny. Um, and because when you write books for kids, and I don't know if this happens when you write books for adults, but when you write books for kids, people will say to you all the time, what lesson did you mean to impart here? And, and Mercy Watson is the answer to that question. Nothing. N nobody learns anything. She, she's a pig, and she likes to eat toast. And, uh, and chaos ensues everywhere she goes. Um, so, so you're saying, would I go on and write um, for adults as well? Is that kind of? Oh, well, that's a lovely thing to say. And you know, I have, I've, when, I started, I, when I started writing, I started writing short stories for adults and um, sending them to literary magazines. And then uh, when I moved to Minneapolis, I got a job in a book warehouse, and I was assigned to the third floor as a picker, which meant I went around filling the orders. And I, as a reader, it was only a certain amount of time before I started to read those books that I was picking off the shelves. And I read a book called The Watsons Go to Birmingham, 1963. Raise your hand if you know it. It's fabulous. If you don't know it, the library has it. Um, and uh, I thought, I want to try to do something like this. So that's, I, I took that book home and tried to figure out how he did that. I typed up a chapter. OK, how long would a chapter be? How long would a whole manuscript be? And so, and then pretty soon after that, I started working on Because of Win Dixie. And I, I just said this in an earlier interview today. I was aware at the time, like, oh, this is where I should be as a, a writer. This is what I should be doing. Is, and because writing for kids, there's room for magic and humor. And there's, um, you know, Catherine Patterson says, you ha you're, you're duty bound to end with hope. And I like all of those directives. I like the magic. I like the humor. And I, I, I love and need the hope. So. Uh, thank you. Um, so we'll do two more questions, although y'all are so fascinating that you're okay, you're all the way in the back and you got stripes on. Yep. 
how do I come up with my character's personalities? Which is the same as um, a question that a lot of adults ask, which is talk to me at great length about character development, which again makes me kind of slightly sweat because I don't know anything about character development and I don't know how to come up with a character's personality because I feel like they're real people and all I do is discover them and then kind of follow them through the story. So I never think about what are the, because sometimes when you're working in a writing workshop, they'll have you do character traits in a, in a character. But again, this is another place where my mind just kind of shuts down. I can't, I can't do it. It's the same way that my mind shut down when I would read a good story in, in school and I would love it and then I would get to the end and there would be five questions. And I was like, oh no. I can't answer these questions. I just loved the story. And that's kind of the way I write, too. I don't think about it as much as feel it. Um, OK, who did not get to, you didn't get to say something. Yes. How do I feel when I have a finished, when I finish a book? I always feel the same way. I am never going to try that again. <laughs> I can't believe that I lived through it. And, and I'll sometimes wake up in the middle of the night after I finish a book and think, oh, no, never again. And then it usually is about um, two weeks, and I think, oh, I don't know. I think I'd like to try to tell a story again. But it's always I can't believe that I lived through it. And then the happiest moment in writing a book is when you're holding that finished book in your hands, and it's just an amazing thing. And then that book goes out into the world, and some kid will write you, um, once they've grown up and say, this is what that book meant to me. And that is un unbelievable, unbelievable. Okay, one more question. And whoever it is, oh, you're, you're from the other room. Yes. Okay, so you, the other room is going to ask the last question. And can I just tell you what you need to do? You need to sum up everything we talked about. And then kind of, if you can, move the conversation forward a little bit. Said, <laughs> okay, I know you can do it. How do I come up with the titles? I actually like titles quite a bit. Um, so I don't always know them as I'm working on it. Sometimes it's not until I've got a complete manuscript and then I'll read through looking for phrases that I think might be the title. And sometimes I'll come up with a title that I think is just spectacular and the publisher doesn't think it is. Um, so, for instance, uh, Louisiana's Way Home, um, the title that I had for it was Louisiana Five and Dime. Doesn't that make you want to pick up the book? They didn't think so. So, there they are, sitting over there in a little cluster right there. <laughs> they voted no. Chris, you were one of the people that voted no. Yeah. So, I'm not always in charge of the titles, but I'm always in there trying, you know? Um, can I say to y'all, this is uh, very kind of you to spend your Friday night um, with books and with uh, other people who love to read books. And again, for all you teachers and for all you parents and all you librarians, anybody who's reading out loud to somebody, anybody who's putting a book in somebody's hands, you have no idea how much it matters. And I cannot thank all those people who did it because most of them are dead, including my mother. <clears throat> But to all of you who are doing it now, I will tell you it matters and you're giving great gifts by doing it. So thank you. And thank you for being here. I'm going to sign somewhere. And I'm going to go talk to the, uh, uh, the, other the other room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's, she's going to go talk to the other room. <laughs> um, I don't know whether or not they have been unveiled, but there are four um, shapes of cookies with um, four different book covers um, on the table in the hallway. So make sure you grab a cookie. The autographing is going to be in the reference room and Porter Square Books is selling some books. Thank you for coming. Huh? Yes? <laughs>